Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. A real pleasure of mine to check in for sort of an outlook on where we're going to be as we start 2024 with uh, Martin Pelche, who is a Senior Portfolio Manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. He's in Calgary, Alberta, where he tells me it has been the warmest uh, Christmas so far in 140 years. So uh, he got some skiing in, but it wasn't spectacular. Uh, but uh, Martin has got over 20 years of public and private market experience. He's a weekly columnist for the Financial Post every Tuesday, and I love reading his uh, columns, and so I wanted to check in with him about what he thinks about 2024. He's uh, uh, talked about uh, a rally that we had in 2023 that he questions what's going to happen in 2024. He's talked about some of the big geopolitical events that uh, um, that uh, are, uh, are occurring around the world and what the impact of that's going to be. And in the past, he's talked quite a bit about debt and deficit. So it's a real pleasure. Martin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Looking forward to it. So tell me, what do you think about the rally that happened in 2023? And is the stock market rally going to continue? Well, it, it, wow, what a last November and December were outstanding. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that it happened around the Fed uh, turning or perceived to be turning very dovish about interest rate drops. In, uh, in in this year, 2024, a market went from expecting three to four drops to as much as six or seven uh, interest rate cuts this year. And uh, and then you had the active managers piling on in order to, to keep up with their benchmarks prior to the end of the year. So, you know, we can close the door on it. It was a, it was a great year uh, for many portfolio managers and investors. Um, but if you back things up a little bit to the year before we just got back to even for for many investors you know the s and flat the tsx is flat bonds are still down five over two years so we just made a big round trip back to even um from the correction the year prior so the big question is is what's going to happen this year and uh and, and if the start to this year is any indication of what lies ahead uh there's going to be some more turmoil because we're seeing uh, some sell-offs happening, especially in in those who, who led the rally last year. I thought your comment was interesting that uh, speculators have returned on mass, plowing into the ris riskiest segments of the market as the top performers. Uh, unprofitable tech stocks, SPACs, companies with bad balance sheets, and shorted companies. Why is that? Well, it, it, it's just when the Fed comes in and says, you know, we're going to loosen things up here, um, the cost of financing speculation or the perceived cost goes down and people think that uh, what's transpired is going to continue. And so you add leverage to torque up your returns and you look at those segments that uh, will move the most. And I think if you dive deeper into it, you look at the bond market, the bond market's done well over the last couple of months and you're able to margin those bond positions and use that to go into the option market and buy calls um, on very speculative uh, stocks um, and also write puts as well. And that's just another form of leverage. So I think that all compounded. Um, now, having said that, I think that's all coming to a close uh, rather quickly. You know, you have companies like um, uh, ARC uh, Fund, which is the, the riskiest of risk in tech. You know, it's down 10% over the last five trading days. Even the behemoth Apple is down 7%. And so um, maybe that's enough to, to stop what we saw in the last uh, two, two months or so. But it certainly was at the time of writing in December, it was just astounding to see the full risk on uh, how comfortable people felt. Why are SPACs up? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't, I don't trade in, in, in that space. Um, it's just another speculative asset, um, asset class. I did put a tweet about Bitcoin um, which I, I do have a little bit of an understanding towards saying that there's a potential for a, a, a large correction in that sector. And I should have done that because I've got a lot of uh, HODLs uh, come, and diamond hands, you know, coming after me and, and saying, I hope I enjoy staying poor <laughs> old man. I didn't realize I was old, but uh, my wife tells me that. And so do Bitcoin traders. So even more market correction in Bitcoin. I don't know. I mean, it's just another speculative asset class. And it's not a an asset class, in my opinion, that is uh, as, as what is being touted to be. It's just to me, it's it's like a Tesla position, or it's it, at at this stage, you'll have some some utility function at some point in time. 
um, and we'll have to own it. But right now, I, I think it, when when you see an ETF starting to come out and the talks about the ETFs, to me, that's signs of a of a top. And when I stop getting these uh, crypto spammers uh, putting comments at the bottom of my tweets saying, you know, invest in this or invest in that, um, when that's done, that's probably a good time to start looking at crypto. You also made a comment about the commodity market, which I found kind of interesting. You're saying that fund managers are more bearish about commodities, more bearish than they've been since March 20, 2009. Yeah. And it, and so you can see that in the U.S. dollar and and that the U.S. dollar is selling off against other currencies. Everybody is towards the end of the year, uh, the cocktail party trade, as I call it, because um, a lot of portfolio managers get together and in the big cities, New York or uh, or in Toronto, for example, and they sh and they all share this, their same ideas. And there is that common thought around, hey, we're going to see a return to deflation. We're going to see a return to low interest rates and a return to quantitative easing. And uh, and so in that kind of environment, you do not want to own commodities. You don't want to own anything that's inflationary uh, driven. You want to own those that are going to benefit from uh, almost a free cost of capital. And, and and so that trade really herded into those segments of the market. We call it long duration equities. And so uh, if you take a look at the at the mega techs, you know, a lot of these companies are trading at 50 times earnings. And uh, at levels at the, the last seen during the uh, tech bubble. And I'm not saying we're at the tech bubble, but I'm saying that there's a lot of people in that trade. And that's starting to unwind because people have locked in their gains for 2023. It's ridiculous how one day all of a sudden it's sort of like I got to hit the gym the next day because it's a whole new year, even though every day is a whole new year to me. Um, it's the same thought process when you're looking at returns and reports and sending that out. So I think that. Um, that trade is starting to unwind, and I think it could come back into the commodities because they're looking at the same things as I am and saying, well, these commodities have been beaten up, and you have this huge geopolitical, and we could talk about that uh, risk that's happening. I've never seen it like this before that could drive inflation back up again and drive some of these resources uh, uh, up despite uh, – um, a moderating or a, a mediocre demand on the economic side. Well, let's come back to that in a minute, uh, if we could. Um, final question. You said that even though you'd had this, uh, I don't know whether you call it a Santa Claus rally, but uh, but this incredible rally, uh, and your comment about uh, high risk sectors of the economy, high risk sectors of the the market being, uh, um, you know, at a, at a top potentially, but you didn't say that seventy one percent of stocks on the S and P are still underperforming the index. Why are 71 still 71% still underperforming if if everything has gone to these uh these these high risk assets? Because um well it's not necessarily all high risk. It's more along the lines who's going to benefit. There are there there are the segment of the higher risk that have done well last year but are still well below their highs from 2022 like Arc for example. Um but you know there's been a tremendous hurting into wanting to track that index. And if you look at the S&P 500, uh, you have a handful of stocks contributing majority, if not all of the returns. And so if you take a look at the S&P versus Ecoweight S&P, the S&P outperformed the Ecoweight S&P uh, by 12% last year, which hasn't happened since 1970 or 1971. So we haven't seen this level of concentration before and everybody going into that. And I think that's just uh, a nature of indexing, number one everybody buying indexes and indexing, owning uh, those larger and larger companies, in addition to active managers. Um, if you miss your benchmark, if you're an, an equity, uh, U.S. equity uh, fund manager and you underperform that index, um, you're going to face outflows. You're going to say, well, why am I paying you management fees? And so you have to own those names. So it just builds and builds and builds upon itself. And now that it's a fresh new year, um, you've got free reign to do what you want. And we're seeing that with uh, with some of the selling off and, and some of these bigger names and taking profit, which is understandable. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back uh, in just two minutes with uh, Martin Peltier. And we're going to talk a little about these geopolitical risks that he uh, that he worries are being ignored, ignored. You can't turn on news without watching what's going on in uh, in Ukraine or uh, or Gaza or or something like that. And you're saying that the market is ignoring it. We're going to be back in two and talk a little bit about this. Stay with us, everybody.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Uh, we're talking about the markets and the economy uh, with Martin Peltier. Martin is a senior portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. He's in Calgary, Alberta. He's got over 20 years of public and private market experience. He's a weekly columnist with the Financial Post. I love following him on LinkedIn because I get all of his comments as well as his uh, columns, and they're really quite interesting. Martin, you sent me something that says what worries you the most this year is rising geopolitical events being completely shrugged off by market participants. What do you mean? And why are they being shrugged off? Well, if, all you have to do is take a look at, at oil prices. And so you have Brent oil prices uh, below $79 a barrel, and uh, that's nearly 40% below its June 2022 highs and 18% below its October of 2023 highs. There's been a big sell-off uh, more recently. And um, when you go back to June of 2022, before that, um, you had the Russian invasion of Ukraine and some concerns about how that would impact Russian output. And uh, and, and now since then, um, let's talk about what's happened since then. Uh, you have uh, Israel and invasion of, of Gaza following the, the horrendous um, Iranian-backed Hamas attack in October of, of last year. And uh, we think things are, are likely to get worse before they get better. And, uh, you know, we saw uh, the Prime Minister of, of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, state that the, the war in Gaza is in full swing and, and it's going to carry across all fronts for several months. And so it is already starting to spread. And we're seeing it in things like Venezuela, Iraq and Yemen. So in Venezuela, for example, you have uh, they're, they're looking at the territorial claims in, in uh, against its eastern neighbor, uh, Guana, and a British warship is in the area. But at the same time, the Venezuelan government is getting uh, speed speedboats with uh, Nasser One anti ship missiles from from Israel and building a factory of drones with help. I'm sorry, not from Israel, from Iran. And Iran's also helping him build a drone factory. And then you've got the Red Sea. And then you've got um, uh, bombings in in Iran and in Iraq. You've got um, protests in, in Libya shutting down the largest oil field there. And then you got China potentially looking at stocking up oil reserves uh, against a spring in, uh, military incursion into Taiwan. So you've got a lot of stuff going on right now, and it's completely being ignored by oil traders. Why? Um, because the pervasive view is we're going to return to deflation, six interest rate cuts, and we're going back to the way it was pre-COVID. I mean, it's just it's just human nature that we get used to something, and it's, it lasts because it lasted for ten years. It gets ingrained in our behavior. There's a great tweet, by the way, and I'll have to. It's on my feed, and it was it was really interesting. What they do is they take a jar, and they put fleas in the jar. They close the lid on the jar. They leave it for three days. They un they open up the lid of the jar. The fleas will not leave the jar. They're, they, they, for some reason, it's ingrained in them that they cannot go, you know, an inch higher than where they are. And you can even, you know, remove the jar theoretically, and they'll still stay in that area. And I think that's just a mindset of it reminds us of of how we are as human beings and human nature that, you know, we're going to go back the way it was pre-COVID, and that's dictating how the market's been positioned. And I'm saying, well. Look at all of this in front of you. There's a lot of things happening that you probably should look at adding a little bit of insurance in your portfolio in case, you know, an Iranian oil facility gets blown up or Iraq go, or uh, uh, Israel goes into Lebanon with Hezbollah or in the Red Sea that, um, you know, uh, an Iranian warship gets into a kerfuffle with a U.S. warship. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on that that could go easily go wrong in a hurry and and then boom you know we have a huge spike in oil prices and we're already seeing a huge spike in in shipping costs you know shipping costs have tripled in that area and that's and that's 18 percent of the world's supply of goods goes goes through that red sea we're going to see shipping costs go up like they were during covid what did that mean that meant inflation and so maybe we're not going to see those seven interest rate cuts uh this year and maybe, you know, those tech stocks that rallied on those interest rate cuts, maybe there's some downside. You know, it's a really interesting uh, point that you're making. I, uh, I, I 
had the occasion over the the Christmas break to watch some of the show, The Crown. I'm not sure if you've watched The Crown, uh, but there was this uh, great speech that was uh, replayed. Uh, uh, Tony Blair went to Chicago during the uh, the fight in Serbia and uh, and spoke to uh, um, a Chicago Board of Trade about uh, American isolationism and how it couldn't exist. And uh, I remember the speech as being very impactful and uh, and that it was very similar to a speech that Churchill made uh, to uh, to the federal uh, to, to, the, to the United States uh, Congress, uh, you know, right after Pearl Harbor. And so I went back and uh, and watched a prior um, oh, wow. crown version that had that speech. Uh, and I also thought it would almost be perfectly applicable today where you've got this incredible tension geopolitically worldwide. And the United States, and I think sometimes we suffer from the same thing in Canada because we're protected from what's going on in the rest of the world by two oceans, if not three. We just we we have an isolationist, uh, you know, it doesn't uh, impact what's going on uh, attitude. What what's going on in the rest of the world attitude? Is that the problem that we that we're we're so far away from what's going on in Israel? We're so far away what's going on in the Ukraine that we don't we don't we don't take it into account. We think we can insulate ourselves from it. Um, I don't know if I agree with that because. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talk. Um, there isn't a lot of action uh, by by political leaders, um, probably because of fear of, of a domestic response. Um, at the same time, I mean, it's hard. It's got to be really hard to be a government because um, you have a, a huge swath of the population that, that doesn't want to get involved and provide funding uh, for these sorts of things. And that there was a consequence of that. You know, you had a very docile approach towards Iran uh, by the Obama and now the uh, existing Biden administration uh, with payment of like that $6 billion. And, and a lot of that found its way into Hamas. And, and maybe we wouldn't be here today if that didn't. Maybe they wouldn't have funded what transpired. And maybe those 1,200 people that were killed in Israel wouldn't have been killed. And so we just don't know. At the same time, you have uh, protests happening, and it's actually being fueled by Chinese organizations and Russia organizations domestically, um, at, at, but these massive Palestinian protests, um, maybe in part due to uh, immigration or, or other things. So it's got to be really hard to be a government when you have your own domestic population protesting about things like Israel and Palestine. Meanwhile, you have you know your own housing crisis in Canada and, and other things. And uh, you have uh, these geopolitical events that are going to destabilize those countries and impact trade. So, I mean, I don't envy them. It's It's got to be being in, in, in politics and being a leader, especially in the U.S., it's just got to be very, very difficult. You also wrote about our challenges in Canada uh, in regards to our gross domestic product per person uh, and that uh, you're saying that it's one of the worst in, uh, in the world. Uh, the council, you said... Uh, uh, ranked Canada's pandemic economic recovery be, to be the fifth worst among 38 member countries of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Canada is only one of eight advanced countries where average real incomes are lower than before the pandemic. Seriously? So we have a real problem and it's getting worse. So I prefer, when I mean, we have a problem, um, you, what you can do is three things. One is you can say, for me, um, which you know you you can do, or you or you could do blame somebody else, which our politicians like to do, <laughs> or 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 it's not doesn't exist. Or three, what are you going to do about it? And and so instead of criticizing, we really need to take a cold hard look at these facts, and 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 identify the parts that aren't doing well. And 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 when you look at your economy, um, GDP growth per capita is important. You have to look at it on a per capita basis. You have to look at, at the economic benefits to every person living here and our level of productivity and how we're going to grow. And the, it's gotten worse in the last you know three to four years, considerably worse. And so obviously what's being done isn't working. And, and so what I'm hearing at Ottawa is we need to double down on what we're doing. And while while if I was a portfolio manager and I had these kinds of results and I go to my clients and say, we, we've we lost this money, but don't worry, we're going to double down on what we've been doing and then we're going to make it better. Well, you know, that, that doesn't really resonate very well. 
And so you need a little bit of humility and you need to say, okay, um, what is the solution here? And it may not be done overnight, but we need to um, look at the cold, hard facts. And, you know, people like Trevor Tolm at the, uh, at the University of Calgary has done a really good job of highlighting that without a political bias. Let's just look at the facts. And the facts are our economy stinks. And it's it stinks among the OECD. And why does it? And what's what's the problem? And I don't have the answers. Um, and I don't pretend to have the answers. But, you know, certainly we should look as a society and say, we can do better. And uh, we can all do better. And we can all benefit from that. And in, in, in the meantime, we're, we're seeing policies that are, are more focused on climate change, which are important, but not nearly as important as our economic prosperity. Because, you know, if you don't have that prosperity, you're not getting paid, you don't have a job, you can't buy a house, you're not really going to care about that carbon tax. You uh, you sent me a graph that showed that our performance uh, has gone from, you know, reasonable to terrible um, relative to all of our peers. So there's other people uh, worldwide uh, in the OECD, et cetera, that have got it right. Um, so there's examples that we could have learned from. Yeah. What do you think is going wrong? Well, I just, I don't think, I mean, I, I would have to say that I, 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 there isn't a lot of good data gathering and, and feedback responses. And so what I mean by that is um, you need to do a really good self-examination of the policies that are being implemented and the economic benefits from that um, instead, of, instead of just simply cheerleading the policies and say, okay, this is working, this isn't working, this is working. We do this all the time as a portfolio manager. Um, I'm looking at the portfolios at the end of the year and say, okay, we did we did well, but the market did well. Um, we did really we did a lot better than anybody else the year before, but what are we gonna do this year and how are we gonna do better? And here's what worked, here's what didn't work and why didn't it work. And we're seeing none of that. We're seeing um, complete denial of these numbers by by governments. And and so um, and it's not just federal. I mean, there's there's uh, the, the if you look at the productivity levels um, of of provinces, um, Alberta's ranked 14th against the 52 states. Uh, Saskatchewan is 20th, and everybody else is at the bottom near Alabama and 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 these southern states. And 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 we need to be asking. Why? Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Are you saying other than Saskatchewan, our economic performance in the provinces? compared to the United States, is the equivalent of Alabama? Uh, North Carolina, Alabama, uh, Missouri, all of these southern states, we're the lowest of the 52 when it comes to productivity. So our productivity is falling. And so we're, we're adding a whole bunch of people into the country, I think one and a half million people last year, um, and our productivity per person is falling. And, and so as a result, if you look at uh, G GDP per capita, it's getting worse. And so um, instead of issue, like if you're looking at a stock, a company, if they're issuing a ton of shares and they're not growing the output, I mean, that's extremely dilutive. And and, and it's a really nasty comparison because um, I, I'm a huge proponent of immigration and adding in good people into this country. And, and you know, I've met somebody on the chairlift, these young people from Ukraine, and it's fantastic to have them in this country and they're spending money and they're working and they're, they want to build a better life and they love it here. And, and that gets outstanding. Um, but putting that aside, we really need to take a look at what we're doing as a nation. I'm really worried about it. And um, and I think Canadians are finally starting to wake up to it. And, and then, you know, are we going to get better solutions from somebody else? I don't know. But all I can say is that what's being done right now is not working and is making it worse. And so, and they're not willing to acknowledge that it is getting worse. And uh, maybe that's just any politician would do that anyway. But as a portfolio manager, um, I'm always quick to admit that when, when we make a mistake and when we could do better and our clients appreciate that humility because they know that I'm going to try and do better. And, uh, and, and I think politicians, if they did the same thing, and said, look, I messed up. I tried my best. I tried to do this and it's not working. We're going to try and do this now, okay? And this has worked before and we're going to double down on what's what's worked before. And we're just not seeing any of that. It's just, you know, binary. You know, they're awful. They're good. Look at look at the opposition. They're not doing anything. And it's just full of nonsense. And I think we just got to pull our, roll up our sleeves for real uh, <laughs> and get some work done. 
you know, in a company, um, there's two issues, uh, you know, is the income, um, operating income, but it's also that relative to the amount of debt you've got and the interest you pay. Uh, and so therefore you've expressed some concerns about uh, our uh, GDP, um, but our debt, our interest bill is also a problem, is it not? That makes it even doubly uh, problematic. It's, um, well, okay. So the the on the government level, we're not as bad as the US. Um, the Biden administration, is running a deficit 8% of GDP, which hasn't occurred since the uh, great financial uh, crisis in 2008. Um, and part of that is, uh, you can probably blame Russia because now the US is funding um, a number of different wars on different fronts. So they're funding Ukraine. Um, now they're funding Israel and uh, and and maybe um, uh, Iraq and other areas too, and, and and maybe if 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 it goes into Taiwan, that that would be a nightmare too. Um, and so they're spending a lot of money on that side, and so there's tremendous pressure on the Federal Reserve to cut rates because that's their debt servicing costs are quite high. In Canada, it's households that that are in really rough shape. And it's because the uh, the term, and I think we talked about this last time. Is significantly shorter than in the U.S. on mortgages. We have nine hundred billion dollars of of mortgage debt coming up for renewal in the next two to three years, and uh, and so there's there's going to be a lot of pressure on households uh, this year. A lot of pressure as these mortgages come up for renewal. We did get some encouragement with the five year bond rate falling uh, towards the end of the year, but that's starting to come back up again. So um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of pressure on on households and Canadians um, and and the U.S. government. So if our GDP is down, GDP per capita is flat or down, uh, the performance relative to our competitors um, are, are comparables, uh, uh, you know, worldwide are uh, are not good. And other than the United States, our debt um, and our interest bill is high, though it may come down because interest rates come down a little bit, but still our debt is high. What's your prognosis for the average Canadian in 2024? Well, thankfully we have oil, okay? Oil provides a backstop. It's, I mean, think about it, oil, when oil, uh, back in the early 2000s, oil uh, was were, was at its levels, you had the Canadian dollar at par. And so high oil prices allow us to have a stronger currency. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, it's, you know, you have the federal government wanting to put target specifically oil and gas with an emissions cap and no other industry. Um, and, and that's quite scary because if if they were successful at that, and we had to compete uh, globally simply on our productivity, which I just outlined is worse than uh, uh, states like Alabama. Imagine what our currency is going to look like. <laughs> um, and it's certainly not going to be at 74 or 75 cents. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a prognosis. Mm -hmm. So um, you can, all of Canada can say, hey, thankfully we've got this oil and gas, um, because if not, our, our dollar would be. Uh, much lower levels and the goods that we import from the U.S. Um, and our Amazon use will probably go down significantly <laughs> because the cost would go up. And uh, and so that that's my worry if we get another eight years of this existing government and they're able to push through these policies, uh, we're going to see a significantly lower dollar. A significantly lower dollar? I thought it was low already. Well, it, you take oil and gas out of the equation and... and um, and you're trying to make people buy all these electric vehicles in rural uh, prob places in rural Alberta, Saskatchewan, and, and other areas. Um, and there's a cap on oil, and you can't produce anything else. And you got to reduce it. Um, you know the dollar is going to be a lot lower than where it is now. And I, I don't see that playing out. Absolutely, I don't. I I don't see this emissions cap getting through. I I see a change in government in the next, especially as these interest costs hit Canadians and. People look at at Trudeau getting a free Jamaican holiday at ninety two hundred dollars a night, and telling them, "Hey, don't worry about your mortgage payment." When you know <laughs> you have a year's worth of mortgage payments in one night at his hotel, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people getting more more and more upset, and there'll probably be a change of government. And oil will still be doing what it's doing. We'll still be producing. Canadian dollar will be at seventy five to seventy eight cents, and uh, and hopefully we can address these uh, these productivity and, and, and GDP issues. We're going to take a break for some messages, and we're going to come back in two minutes with uh, Martin Peltier. Uh, and I'm going to ask him about a really interesting post he wrote about uh, uh, Charlie Munger and the Book of Job, and ask him about what what 
what was that all about? Because uh, he said that the challenges we face in life and in the markets can actually make us better people and investors. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. My guest tonight is uh, Martin Pelche, a very, very smart guy. Uh, Martin, in one of your columns uh, in the Financial Post, I guess a couple of weeks ago, when Charlie Munger uh, from Berkshire Hathaway passed away, you uh, wrote that uh, we can learn a lot from Charlie Munger and the book of Job and how challenges we face in life and in the markets can make us better people and better investors. We just need to stop comparing ourselves and our portfolios to everyone else. Tell me about that. Um, so I think a lot of people went through um, a lot of turmoil. Um, I know I have and, and, and friends have the last couple of years um, with the COVID shutdowns, uh, the market's been all over the place, mental health crisis. And so um, one of two things, you can um, bury that stuff deep down inside and pretend it doesn't exist, um, which it will one day uh, uh, grow wings and and uh, and take you crashing down. Or you can say, hey, look, um, I went through this. And I'm a different person, and um, I'm, I'm a completely different person than I was before, and um, it transformed me for the better. And so in the case of Charlie Munger, a lot of people don't know his story, but he wasn't always wealthy. Um, in his 30s, he just got divorced. His son had cancer and was dying, and uh, and it bankrupted him because he couldn't, I mean, all the medical bills. Um, so he had to start from scratch again. And and then uh, 10 years later, he lost an eye and they were told he's gonna lose his, his, his vision entirely. And he says, fine, to give me, I'll just learn how to read Braille. And so he, he came in and, and took that challenge and turned it around and built something and, uh, and, and built a, a new life out of it um, for the better. It doesn't downplay what happened and the tragedy of what happened, but he used it to be transform into something beautiful and something different. And then in the case of Job, um, you have uh, uh, an individual, and I always wondered about that story. Uh, for those who haven't read it, it's an individual is challenged uh, by the devil so that um, while it's easy to worship and be friendly to God when things are going great and you have all this money and you have all these kids and successes, let me get, let me get at them. And so God said, yeah. And he went at him and burnt and lost everything and his kids. And and the, the historical translation is that that the, the interpretation is that he lost his family, his kids, they died. But I like to look at it, at it as um, the kids went through the same kind of challenges as the dad did. And the wife went through the same challenges as the dad did. And they lost everything. And the family came out of it new. He had new kids and a new wife and a new house and a new everything was new. And he came out of that that challenge um, when everybody was telling him to give up and to blame somebody else or poor me, blame them. And both Charlie Munger and and Job said, "What am I going to do about it?" And they did something about it, and they're they're better. They were much better off for it. Now there isn't always a happy ending. There's always tragedies and things that happen. Um, but you know, having that approach has been really useful and being cognizant of it for my own life. And even my job, because looking at 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 the markets, there's there's great days, there's days it's, it stinks, um, and you go through periods like we saw two years ago, and you say, okay, um, how am I going to get better out of this, and uh, and what am I going to learn from? So I think that ties in on on investing, it ties in on your life, it ties in on government. It's just a it's just a philosophy that I believe in. You quoted uh, some of uh, Charlie Munger's. Comments on self-pity, and uh, let me read some of them if I could. Generally speaking, envy, resentment, revenge, and self-pity are disastrous modes of thought. Self-pity gets pretty close to paranoia. Every time you find yourself drifting into self-pity, I don't care what the cause, your child could be dying of cancer. Self-pity is not going to improve the situation. It's a ridiculous way to behave. Life will have terrible blows, horrible blows, unfair blows. It doesn't matter. Some people recover and others don't. Great uh, 
Great column. Thank you. I appreciated that one a lot. Um, I appreciate all your columns, but that one was kind of interesting. Um, so Martin, 2024, new year. Where should we be investing in the market? Where are you advising people to uh, put their money? So we take uh, a goals-based approach. And as you mentioned in, in that uh, Charlie Munger at the beginning of, of your question, um, try not to compare yourself to anybody else. And when you do that, you, there's tremendous freedom in it. And, and so everybody's trying to compare to a benchmark. And, and so, you know, one year you have uh, the S&P 500 do really well, or one year you have energy do really well. And, and then you're always feeling bad about not being able to, why didn't I call that one? Or why didn't I call that one? And so we try and step away from all of that. And, uh, and so we say, okay, what kind of target return do we need to get to make our clients happy? And how do we get that regardless of what everybody else is trying and thinking and doing and that sort of thing. And so um, when we're making an investment, we take a look at simple things like the intrinsic value of something and how much cash flow is going to be generated and the terminal value at judgment day of the, of, of the business or investment that you're making. And, uh, and so, for example, one of the, the great uh, um, pieces that, that, that I, I really resonated with me was talking about Microsoft. And if you bought Microsoft in, in 2009 and held it to 2012, um, it grew its cash flow by 300%, outstanding, but the stock fell 55%. And simply because you bought it at 50 times free cash flow and it went to eight times free cash flow. And then from 2012 to now, it's up 12, 12, it's a 12 bigger and its cash flow only grew 130% uh, because you bought it at eight times multiple and sold it at 50 times multiple. So that makes investing really difficult, um, especially if you're ignoring it when now you're paying 50 times free cash flow. What's going to happen in 10 years? And so we're like, ah, I don't want to own that for 10 years at 50 now. Uh, is it going to go to 60 or 70 times free cash flow on terminal value? It could do the best cash flow in the world, but I don't think it's going to 60 times free cash flow. So we're not in that space. Maybe we'll get back into it. So we'll look at things from that perspective. And then we'll look at things that are going to be asymmetric in, in their payoff profile. So we'll do uh, things like structured notes. We did a note two years ago on uh, on on um on U.S. banks and uh, U.S. banks delivered a eight uh, percent return uh, over that period of time, and our structured note delivered a seventeen percent rate of return over that time, and it had a twenty percent downside. So we'll look at things creatively to offer downside protection, get a little bit of upside torque, but protect the minimize that ups and downs. And I can sleep at night, and our clients can sleep at night, not not having to compare to others, not having to look at the market and uh, reduce that that potential trauma of losing money. If people want to access your, uh, your thinking, your advice, uh, um, want to access your services, how do they best do that? Um, you can go on our website um, at www.trivestwealth.com. Um, that'll link through a Wellington Altus uh, uh, parent company and it'll show our website. You can follow me on Twitter um, and LinkedIn. And um, I'm pretty, I write quite a bit on, on Twitter and in the Financial Post every Monday afternoon. It gets published online and in print on Tuesday. Martin, what's your best bet for 2024? Um, Mid-cap oil and gas. Mid-cap oil and gas. Sounds good. Yeah. So I'm uh, putting some money in uh, in real estate in uh, in the oil and gas sector. So that sounds like it's probably a good bet as well then. Probably. If if any of these geopolitical events hit, uh, these things are trading at two times, three times free cash flow, not 50. And uh, if oil prices stay at where they are, they don't need to go higher in 12 months. I think uh, some of these oil companies will be worth twice as much as they are now. And uh, that's a that's a nice bet. I mean, it's a small part of, of our portfolios. We own Suncor and C&Q, which have done fantastic. Um, and our mid caps have not done very well at all. For a number of different reasons, but uh, if I was going to put some money and I have uh, into a speculative bet, that would be uh, where I would put it. And real estate, that sounds interesting. Martin Pelche, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Great advice. And uh, I liked uh, not only your uh, your comments on the economy and the market, but also your comments, Charlie Munger and life. Really appreciate it. We're going to take a final break and I'm going to come back with some of my own concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Martin Pelche, thanks again. Thank you.